Good morning, everybody. Sorry, we needed to make a really big, splashy entrance. Um, I'm Danielle Pletka. I'm the Senior Vice President for Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm really delighted to, that you're, to have you all here today with us to talk about, more broadly about, uh, about Arab armies, but more specifically, I hope, a little bit about uh, Ken Pollock's new book, Armies of Sand, which, uh, which the title is really a bit of a dead giveaway for all of us. Um, but for those of us who, who have observed the U.S. government support for Arab armies over the years, we have seen really, I, w I would have said millions, but it's really tens of billions of dollars that we've spent in support, in training, in education, in weaponry, to, as we see in Yemen, as we see in the Sinai, not always spectacular effect. The question really isn't the effect. The question is, why? Why is there such a problem in building capable and effective and um, can-do militaries in the Arab world? I'm not going to give you any spoilers. This is what we're here to talk to Ken and to Lieutenant General Sean McFarland about. All of you, of course, know both of them. Ken Pollock is a, is a scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute. We stole him away from next door, and we're very delighted about that. He used to be at the Brookings Institution. Before that, he was on the National Security Council staff. He was at the CIA. This is his 10th book. Oh my God, I can't believe that. And I'm going to have to cheat because Lieutenant General McFarland is very accomplished. And I can't remember these things as well. He's a senior fellow at Harvard University at their Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and a senior fellow at the Association of the U.S. Army's Institute of Land Warfare. He told me not to read his resume to you, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's very impressive. Before his retirement in 20, 2018, he served as a commanding general of the 3rd Armored Corps in Fort Hood. He's been deployed multiple times to the Balkans. He's nodding. He remembers it. Middle East and Afghanistan, and from September of 2015 until August of 2016, he was the commanding general of Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve. He's a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, and you have the Combat Action Badge. I can't, I can't not put this in there. This is, this is too good. Combat Action Badge of the Defense Distinguished Service Medal, two Legions of Merit, and three Bronze Star Medals. How could I not put that in there? I know he's nodding and blushing. What we're going to do today is Ken's going to come up and just really give you a short talk uh, about the book and about issues surrounding the book. And then Lieutenant General McFarland and I are going to come up here and we're going to have a conversation with each other, but also with you about the issues surrounding it. So, Ken, thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Uh, thank all of you for coming out this morning. And yeah, my goal is really to just um, give you some context for the conversation that we're going to have about building a better mousetrap or building better Arab militaries. Um, and so I wanted to use the book to give you a little bit of context about how to think about the wider set of problems in the region. Um, for me, this whole topic began 28 years ago. Uh, I was a young CIA analyst. I had just written the CIA's post-mortem on Iraqi strategy and operations during the Persian Gulf War. And that was a monumental effort. It was a massive project. And when it got done, I had to kind of go back to my day job. I had to kind of clear my inbox. And one of the things in my inbox was a paper on the Syrian military written by our Syrian military analysts. And I had to clear off on that because it had some things about Iraq and Iran in there. And as I was going through it, what was striking was that the Syrian military analysts were talking about all of the problems that the Syrian military routinely had in combat. And they were the exact same problems that the Iraqis had. Right? And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, that is just fascinating. They have this exact same set of problems. They are crippling for the Syrians as they were crippling for the Iraqis, and crippling for the Iraqis both during Desert Storm and during the Iran-Iraq War. What's going on here? Right? What's, what's exactly is, is the problem that they're both dictatorships? Is the problem that they're both pretty underdeveloped societies? Is it that they rely on Soviet military methods, the Syrians a lot more than the Iraqis, but nevertheless there's some influence from the Iraqis as well? Was it the fact that they're both Arab countries? What was going on here? And 28 years later, I've got this book. 
which does explain all of it, right, and goes into it. And this, the starting point for the book is, not surprisingly, uh, the impact of Arab societies, right? And Raymond Aron once made a, a really insightful statement when he said that all armies are the product of their societies. Right? And at some levels, that's obvious, right? At one level, that's kind of an easy, obvious thing. You know, I say, it's like, yeah, of course, right? How could it be otherwise? But of course, the problem is that for many decades, perhaps even centuries, uh, Western military analysts in particular have tended to disregard that. Right? And what we've mostly focused on are questions like, how many tanks has this force got? And how good are their tanks? How many planes have they got? Even things like, you know, what's their doctrine? What's their training? Not recognizing that the training, the doctrine, actually grows from those societal factors. Right? The more that you look at armies, the more that you look at military history, the more that you recognize that every army works in a somewhat different fashion. Right? They've all got their own styles, their own ways of war, as other people have pointed out. Those ways of war are organic to, their, to the organizations and to the wider societies. Right? They've all come at war fighting in a certain set of specific ways because of how their societies are organized, how their militaries are organized, the history of their militaries over the course of time, which developed in response to different circumstances. And this book is really about how that has worked for the Arabs since effectively World War II, right up to the present time. Now, it's a big book. There's a lot of depth in it. There's a tremendous amount of research. As I said, I've been more or less working on this thing for 25 years. I can't give you everything that's in it. That wouldn't be helpful right now. Um, and besides, then you got no reason to buy and read the book. But you did come out this morning. So you do deserve at least a thumbnail, right? You get the basics of the book, the essentials. And I think it is important because it's critical to kind of understand this context as we then have a conversation with Lieutenant General McFarland about his own experiences, right? Trying to build a better Iraqi security forces and then figure out how you employ them in battle, right? How you partner with them and help them to accomplish a set of objectives which were critical for American in national security interests. Right. So briefly, what's fascinating about the Arab armies since the Second World War is that when you read accounts of their military campaigns, they read like carbon copies of each other. Right? They, re they literally read as if they are plagiarized versions of each other's accounts. You see again and again and again the Libyans making the same mistakes, doing the same things wrong, experiencing the same problems as the Egyptians, as the Syrians, as the Saudis, as the Iraqis, as the Jordanians. It doesn't matter who they're fighting. They fought Israelis, they fought Iranians, they have fought Tanzanians and Chadians, they fought each other. It doesn't matter where they're fighting, mountains, cities, deserts, swamps, it doesn't matter what they're trying to accomplish. Offensive operations, defensive operations, insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, the problems are the same. It's not that there aren't variations. There are. The Libyans, it turns out, are much better at logistics than the Syrians are. Right? The Syrians tend to have much better unit cohesion than the Saudis do. So there are national variations. But what's striking is actually the similarities far more than the differences. Now, to really boil it down, what you find throughout all this military history and right up to the present is that there are problems at every level of the chain of command. And again, please understand, I'm really boiling this down. I am really simplifying a very complex set of issues here. But I do want to give you the thumbnail sketch. Right? So at the very top of uh, at the Arab chain of command, the strategic level, what you often find is that their generals not all of them, but many of them are hacks who just don't know what they're doing. And even the good ones tend to be badly constrained by a set of just bizarre command and control arrangements that make it hard for even the good ones to do what they know how to do. Okay. At the bottom of the chain of command, the enlisted personnel, what you typically find there is that the, the guys, and they're all guys, at the bottom of the chain of command 
really have no understanding of how their weaponry works and what it takes to service and maintain them. And as a result, oftentimes they just can't bring as many weapons as they have to bear in battle because too much of the stuff is broken and you know in maintenance depots. And even what they can bring to battle, they oftentimes don't really understand how to get the fullest extent out of those weapons. Right? So we'll sell them, the Russians will sell them, some pretty sophisticated pieces of equipment and they just don't know how to take full advantage of those capabilities. Right? And then finally, in the middle level, right, which turns out to be the most important set of problems at all, the middle managers, the field grade officers, and the NCOs, what you find time and time again is that there are tremendous problems with passivity, with lack of initiative, with lack of imagination. Right? Arab junior officers have tremendous difficulty taking advantage of fleeting opportunities, reacting to unexpected developments in combat, seizing the initiative, acting aggressively. Right? And again, you find this again and again and again from military to military, from war to war, all across the Arab world. All right, where does this come from? Again, this is the cuts of the book, but I'm, so I'm gonna give you a very simplified version, but it's not a wrong version. It's just a simple version of it. The problems at the top of the chain of command primarily come from the poor politics, the civil-military relations of the Arab world. You guys all know this. Uh, the Arab militaries started overthrowing their governments in 1949. Right? And that combination of military dictatorships on the one hand and governments who were terrified of getting overthrown by those militaries on the other combined in utterly perverse ways. Right? For the military dictatorships, the militaries would come into power and then get horribly distracted by civilian concerns and then start fighting amongst themselves over political issues and who was going to rule and who wasn't. Right? For the governments that weren't yet overthrown by militaries but who were worried about it, including the military dictators who had just overthrown somebody else and didn't want it to happen to them, Right? They became obsessed with controlling the military to prevent it from overthrowing them. Right? And so they would oftentimes pick people for their loyalty, pick generals for their loyalty rather than their competence. Although typically they tried to get people who were both loyal and competent, but you can't always be sure of that. And you can often be more certain of, the pers of a person's loyalty than necessarily his competence. And then they would create these bizarre command and control structures to make sure that they could keep an eye on the military and prevent it from moving against them. I, one of my favorite examples of that from the October War in 1973, the Syrians had you know, close to 30 combat brigades going into that war and by all rights should have had about 10 divisional commands for it. But Hafez al-Assad wasn't going to have 10 divisional commands because there were only five guys he trusted to command a division. Right? It was too much military power in one place. And you may remember 1958, when the Iraqi government was overthrown, it was overthrown by a division commander. Hafez was not going to make that same mistake. So he only had five division commanders for these 30 brigades. Now, the plus side was he picked really good commanders. Those five guys, Tawfiq Jahani, Ali Aslan, these were really competent commanders. And during the October War, they do very well. The forces under them don't, but they do, right? The problem is each one of them is commanding six brigades, six maneuver brigades, when they should have been commanding three, plus a couple of artillery brigades, plus a whole bunch of other stuff on top of it, and it's just too much for them to command. Right? So it's an example of how these states have distorted their strategic level command and control to, gain, to keep control over the military, right, which has kept them in power, but hindered their militaries, and in particular hindered their generals from conducting the wars the way that they should. Okay, switch to the bottom. At the lowest levels, the enlisted personnel, the biggest issue there is about underdevelopment. It's about economics. Right? The simple fact is the Arab world never really industrialized. It still hasn't. Right? They're kind of skipping ahead. They're jumping over the industrial revolution and jumping into the information age. Right? But the critical issue there is warfare from 1945, heck, warfare all throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century has been industrial age warfare. 
as my old mentor Barry Posen liked to say, we went from man, sorry, arming the man to manning the arms. Right? And think about it. There was a time when what people wanted to know was how many men were there in an army. Now what we want to know, how many tanks, how many planes, how many artillery pieces, how good are the tanks, how good are the planes. Right? It's all about the weapons themselves. And if you can't take full advantage of your weapons and you can't bring enough weapons to bear, you know, chances are you are going to lose in industrial age warfare. And the problem that Arab society had was because it didn't fully industrialize, its people didn't have the same familiarity with machinery that other armies did. I've got great statistics in the book talking about the prevalence of things like cars and phones and TVs in the Arab world compared to the Western world and East Asia. And what you see is there was just a much greater availability of this equipment. And so the average American, the average European came to the army with a much better understanding of how machines worked. They were just familiar with them. They just encountered them day to day. Right? They knew that you, know, you have to have, you have to change the oil in a car every few thousand miles, and you probably need to do that for your tank too. Right? And they had a better understanding of, okay, how do I get maximum performance out of these things? It's one of the reasons why, one of the you know, interesting things that you see, and by the way, I was kind of amused when I saw the Indians were flying MiG-21s in this latest little uh, contretemps with the Pakistanis. Because one of the things that you saw in the Arab world was that the Arabs would buy these more and more sophisticated aircraft. They couldn't fly them. Right? Even when you know, the Egyptians had F-16s, their MiG-21 squadrons typically were better trained, more capable, because the MiG-21 was a much simpler plane. Right, which their pilots were better able to fly than the ultra-sophisticated F-16s that we were selling them. Right? And so for the bottom levels, the enlisted personnel, the big issue there was this lack of familiarity with industrial age weaponry, right? which is how war was made during this entire period and still is to a great extent. The last problem, the middle piece. The middle piece is largely an issue of culture. Now. I spent a lot of time in the book talking, you know, laying out the caveats, right? Culture is a very sensitive topic. And as I say in the book, working with culture is often like working with nitroglycerin, right? It may be necessary, it can be extremely useful, but if you aren't incredibly cautious with it and you aren't very respectful of it, you can do a lot of damage, right? I can't give you all of the caveats that I give you in the book. Right? But I am going to try to be careful with this subject. And there's a lot to this, and it affects things in a variety of different ways. But the easiest way to understand the issues that Arab culture has produced for Arab militaries is that understand that every society has organizations, has hierarchies. Right? We all have them. But everybody's hierarchies function differently. Right? For those of you who've been to Japan or Germany or Brazil, right, you know that their organizations, their hierarchies just function differently from ours. Right? And a simple way to think about it is some societies have more bottom-up hierarchies, some have more top-down, some are from the middle out, some are kind of hybrid systems, right? but they all function differently. How people are taught to behave when they're at the top of a hierarchy, when they're at the bottom of a hierarchy, when they're in the middle, how they're relating to each other, to their superiors, to their subordinates, all of that is driven by a society's culture. Right? And again, every society has different ways of doing that, and they all work for those organizations in their own context. Right? The thing about culture is that culture is the response of a society to its environment, to its circumstances. Literally, its physical environment, its historical experiences, all that kind of stuff. So it always works, right? because there's a Darwinian process that produces the way of doing things that's best for that society in those circumstances. The problem is, Warfare is a competitive activity, and it pits one set of organizations from one society against the organizations of another. Right? And who wins is determined by the logic of warfare at that moment in time. Different kinds of warfare, different periods of history have demanded different skills from the militaries to succeed. 
different points in time, you know, if you wanted to win in combat, you had to be able to do this. And at another time, doing that same thing would be a huge disadvantage. The issue that the Arabs have had in the 20th century, their biggest set of problems, is that the way that Arab society, the way that Arab culture organized their hierarchies worked for them in their own context. The problem was it did not mesh at all with industrial age warfare. What industrial age warfare called for, the skill sets required by industrial age warfare were the exact opposite of the skill sets produced, encouraged, emphasized by Arab culture. And the easiest way to understand that, industrial age warfare is all about bottom-up command structures. Right? This is what the Germans first figured out in the two world wars and what, every, what the rest of us all had to learn painfully from their example. Right? You build from the bottom up. It's all about the guys at the point of the spear who recognize opportunity, who take advantage of opportunities, right? who are able to drive the train forward. There's a German uh, concept called Auftragstaktik, which embodies this, mission-oriented orders. The commander provides a general guidance to the subordinates as to what he or she wants to do, and it is up to them to figure out how to do it and to improvise based on the broader components of the plan to make sure that it happens. Right? This is how you succeed. This is how the German army conquered most of Europe. Right? It's how we and the Russians and everyone else had to then learn to beat them back and then to win during the rest of the century. And the problem is that Arab society, Arab culture, is overwhelmingly about top-down hierarchies where all orders, all ideas, all initiative comes from the very top and trickles down, is issued down to those below them. And those lower down in the chain of command, they are not expected to think for themselves. They are not expected to show initiative, to be aggressive, to try to fix the problem, to try to come up with solutions. Their job is to simply wait for orders. And that has been the killer for Arab armies all throughout the 20th century and on into the 21st. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, but that gives you at least the basics of what has been going on and why the Arab armies have had so much difficulty over the last 70 years. Right? But it's also worth thinking about the fact that this is kind of time limit. And I hope one of the, com the questions that we're going to talk about with General McFarland as we get into it is what's changing out there. Because the truth is, things are changing. The Middle East is changing, the Arab world is changing, and warfare is changing. The war that he waged in 2014, 15, 16 was very different from the war that he fought back in 2006, 2007. And certainly very different from the wars that you were contemplating thinking when you first came into the army. Right? And so the real question for us is, what can we learn from those experiences and how do we apply it in the future? And can we build the Arab armies, our allies, into a more formidable force, or are they just going to remain armies of sand? Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ken. That was really super. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what Ken just laid out for us. You've got the on-the-ground experience. Um, he painted a really damn depressing <laughs> picture. Uh, does that accord with what your, what your experience was on the ground? Um, well, of course. I, I mean, one of the things I did when I was uh, commander uh, of Operation Air Resolve, uh, one of the first things I did was invite Ken over to, to help me uh, understand the operational environment. Uh, that I was uh, facing because I did recognize that things had changed since 2007 when I'd last been in Iraq. And uh, what uh, he laid out <clears throat> was, uh, was uh, accords very closely with uh, my own observations. And uh, prior to coming in here, I, I, I told Ken that uh, one of the things that I did as a one star in the Army was we looked at the profession of arms within the United States Army as a study and the importance of uh, some of the key uh, attributes of any profession, and particularly in the Army, is trust. And all the things that Ken was talking about uh, erodes trust. And in a combat situation 
what gives you flexibility uh, uh, and uh, the uh, ability to be aggressive uh, in dangerous situations is when you trust your chain of command and you trust the people to your right and left. Um, and there are many things that work against that level of trust in, uh, in Arab armies. Uh, uh, the the top-down, the separation between officers and enlisted, the conscript, the lack of training. Uh, you know, and now it's not uniform. There are pockets of uh, high-performing units. And in Iraq, what we saw was the counterterrorism service, the CTS, was a uh, the highest performing force on the battlefield, much better than ISIS or the Peshmerga or anybody else. Um, why was that? Well, they had a higher level of training. Um, they had, to a greater degree, set aside their own uh, internal uh, differences in terms of uh, sectarian backgrounds and so forth. They were a truly national force, or as national as any force can be in Iraq. And uh, they were uh, you know, very uh, well-trained uh, compared to others. And, and that, that level of confidence uh, and trust in one another and in their officers who uh, spent a lot more time with them and shared uh, a lot of the sacrifice uh, resulted in a higher degree of commitment that was manifested on the battlefield. Um, uh, just a quick data point, of the 14 battalion commanders that started the war in the counterterrorism service, all 14 were killed in action. Um, that happens when you lead from the front. And s soldiers will follow their officers almost anywhere. Um, they won't necessarily go where they're told, though. Um, you know, they, you have to, if you're leading them, they will follow um, if they trust who you are and where you're taking them. And they knew those, those officers. Uh, they knew that they were well-trained and dedicated and had the same values as they did, so they followed them. And uh, without the CTS, I don't know where we would be right now. We would probably be still sitting somewhere outside the <laughs> outskirts of Ramadi uh, in Beji uh, trying to hold the line. So what's the big, the big difference between your two experiences, you know, 2006 to 2015? If you had to sort of pinpoint the, the one thing, you've talked a lot about training uh, and the importance of training. You've also talked a little bit about, you alluded to a little bit of diversity. When you say a truly national force, that the implication of that is not from one particular area or another. Um, try and pinpoint it a little. So the 2006-2007, um, I was in Ramadi, the um, I started out up in Telfar, Nineveh, West Nineveh province in the north, and then uh, dealt a lot with the Kurds and folks like that. And then I came down south uh, to Anbar province where it was more heterogeneous uh, situation. Uh, very few Shia, almost all Sunni, and very tribal. And um, the tribes, of course, uh, have their own internal dynamics. And I won't go into that because uh, that's uh, very complex in its own right. But at least they were mostly Sunni, and they were dealing with a Sunni threat from within. And the, the secret to uh, defeating that was to get the, the Sunnis to uh, have a common cause against the, the terrorists, the Salafist terrorist threat, the Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, which became the Islamic State in Iraq. Um, and also, to give them a sense of uh, uh, confidence in their ability to police their own ranks without having to bring in uh, the Shia, predominantly Shia Iraqi security forces. So they began to populate the police and uh, form their own tribal force and actually populate the army divisions, particularly the 7th Army Division out in Anbar province. And so they felt like the Iraqi security forces were in Anbar and West Nineveh were really their own Iraqi security forces, and they had trust and confidence in them, and that worked well. Well, after we withdrew from Iraq uh, in 2011, Nuri al-Maliki uh, purged most of the, the Sunnis out of the Iraqi security forces. They became Shia, uh, overwhelmingly Shia, and when uh, ISIS... Uh, invaded, basically, uh, although it's 
complicated because they really started in Iraq, went to Syria, and then invaded from Syria back into Iraq. Uh, but anyway, when they swept into Iraq, the Shia felt like uh, they, the Shia security forces felt like they were not really um, on their own home turf. They were strangers in a strange land, surrounded by Sunnis or Kurds, um, and uh, and the Kurdish, predominantly Kurdish divisions in the north kind of withdrew north of the old Green Line <clears throat> and became Peshmerga again. And the Iraqi security forces, uh, let's just say, rapidly withdrew uh, towards Baghdad. And, uh, and the result was the extension of the caliphate, more than doubling in size. So that um, was the situation when I arrived in Iraq that, uh, that, that you know, the, the lack of cohesiveness, the lack of trust in the Iraqi security forces, and to an extent within Syria, uh, the Syrian regime forces, had created this opening for ISIS. And, uh, you know, uh, we obviously had greater success in putting Humpty Dumpty back together again in Iraq than the Russians did in Syria. I mean, we had to take over about, you know, half of the battlefield in, in Syria to get that back, too. So it's a... Uh, very complicated question that you ask, uh, but the, the difference over time, that if I had to put my finger on one thing, I'd say Nuri al-Maliki. <laughs> yeah, in a bad way. Yeah, let, no, let me jump, jump in, in if I can, just to kind of uh, take some of Joe McFarland's remarks and put them into this, this wider context so we can think about how we do this a little bit better. Because first, to pick up the last point, you know, what we saw in Iraq after 2011, exactly as McFarland, General McFarland was talking about, is one of the worst examples of, of the impact of bad civil military relations that you can point to, right, where Maliki was deliberately picking out, first, a lot of the Sunnis and getting them out exactly the way General Farland was talking about. But it's also, he's you know, being a little bit modest here, along with a lot of his friends, also picking out the commanders that we had painstakingly, that you had painstakingly picked out in that 2005, 2006, 2000 time frame Right, the better Iraqi officers who we had made sure got promoted, got command of different units, right? Maliki came in and he basically just wipes them out, pulls them all out because he knows they're not loyal to him, they're loyal to Iraq, they're loyal to the army, they're loyal to the mission, right? He doesn't want that. He wants people who are loyal to him. And so he takes all of the guys who we pulled out, all of our rejects, and says, puts them back in along the lines of, now you're my guy, right? I put you back in, so you're my guy, right? That horribly politicizes things. And then, you know, you see this collapse. One of the interesting things about the collapse in 2014 is it's a top-down collapse. So one of the first things that happens is when ISIS starts coming in, all of the senior officers, all the generals, they just abandon their men. Right? We've got these great stories from these Iraqi companies and battalions who were stuck out there in Anbar and Salah Din for a week or more, just kind of going, what are we supposed to do now? Right? Our generals abandon us. We're not getting any supplies. What do we do? And it's kind of fascinating is how long it takes them to break up right, and to fall apart. And then kind of on the flip side, you're know, talking about the CTS, you know, again, what you wound up doing there was, was really a tour de force, right? And it's something that, again, we've seen with some other Iraqi militaries. The Syrians do it with their commandos in the 70s and 80s, the Iraqis with the Republican Guard in the 90s, right? But nobody does it the way that we and the Iraqis do it during that 2014, 2018 timeframe, where we take a small elite body, pick out basically all the best soldiers and officers in the whole army, Come, you know, put them in one place, give them the best training, the best support possible, and turn them into a really quite capable group. Now, the one downside I'll point out, and I, I just it's on my mind, because uh, last time I was in Iraq, I was talking to one of your old buddies there, uh, Brigadier Saadi, oh, the, yeah. uh, right. you know, the, the rock star of the CTS, yeah. right? This guy's the James Dean of the Iraqi CTS, right? I've got, I've got my picture with him. Every like young woman in Iraq wants to have her picture with this guy because he is he is it. U and, U.S. Army Ranger School graduate. Yeah, yeah, he's a pretty remarkable guy. He's one tough hombre, um, and he carries himself like it. But one of the points he made to me was, you know, look, we've had so many of these guys of our best guys brought into the CTS and then killed, exactly the way that General McFarland pointed out. The line formations in the army now are really hurting. 
right? Because we basically took all their best, put them here, created this one really good force. But as a result, the rest of the army isn't as good as it once was. And it was kind of interesting to hear that from them. Yeah, and uh, there's a certain amount of resentment uh, in the regular army towards the CTS because they get a little bit better pay, but hey, they carry more of the risk too. But the army generally won't move. and They don't like the CTS, but they won't move unless the CTS is in front of them. And I had a pick CTS units and put them in front of, you know, just a battalion of CTS would be enough to get an entire Iraqi army division to move someplace. Um, and then uh, the, that division may supply the CTS with enablers like tanks or bulldozers or something like that to help the CTS get through uh, whatever they were trying to fight through. Um, but generally, unless the CTS was there, the Iraqi army would be immobilized. So. I want to I want to ask you a question, and maybe this will also build a bridge for us to talk a little bit about um, about issues outside of Iraq. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, our colleague Michael Rubin did a big piece of work on Sykes Pico and on the hundredth anniversary, right? Um, because it has become very popular to again argue, you know, no, these these countries they're not real, and of course, if you're not a real country, you know, a lot of what you've both suggested is well, and 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 in fact. These soldiers don't fight like they're fighting for a country. They're much more loyal to these older, whether it's sectarian or tribal or familial divisions. Um, and, and I I actually don't buy the argument on Sykes-Picot. There are Iraqis. You know, We know there are Iraqis, Sunni, Shi'i Iraqis. Together, they don't like Iranians, regardless of sect. You know, and we can go through the region and kind of take this down. But I'm wondering how this, how we can better contend with, and even how they can better contend with this sectarian problem. Mm. Uh, the bridge I want to build for you for a second is under the Taif Accords, um, the Lebanese army, which was, you know, there was a Lebanese armed force, but then there were all of these sectarian militias that had grown out of the Lebanese civil war. All of these militias, except our friends in Hezbollah, and that's something else I want to ask you both about, but all of these militias were melted into the army, and then the army was deconfessionalized. People were plucked out of one division where they were with their sectarian, religious, tribal, whatever mates, and put in other places. And they were also put in places to serve uh, to serve in areas where they weren't uh, where they weren't from that were alien to them, so that sort of diminished the the problems. How how going forward do are we supposed to help address and are our capable Arab leaders supposed to address this cultural religious <coughs> reality based challenge? Well, I would just say the thing about Lebanon is different from. Uh, Iraq is uh, uh, Iraq is uh, inextricably linked to Iran just by proximity. I mean, and they're a mostly Shia country, um, and the Iranians, particularly after we uh, withdrew in 2011, uh, have their tentacles into almost all parts of the body politic in Iraq. So any attempt to deconfessionalize the Iraqi security forces would have to uh, be approved by uh, uh, Tehran, and, and that's unlikely to happen. Um, and so, I mean, we just have to recognize that. There's, uh, the Iranians have influence in Lebanon, uh, you know, through Hezbollah, certainly, but it's just not the same situation there from, from what I've seen. And, and Syria is uh, somewhere in between. So, so that's a challenge in Iraq. And, and every attempt that we made to uh, create more uh, heterogeneous units, and at one point we were actually tracking uh, you know, the leadership by battalion, what the distribution was between Iraqi, Sunni, and, or I mean Sunni, Shia, or Kurd, um, that's gone. Uh, and I, I suspect if we were able to get a pretty good census uh, Today, it would be rather uniformly uh, Shia. Um, and that creates problems when, when you're trying to go to Mosul 
from Baghdad to recapture Mosul, uh, that was about 100 kilometers north of the sectarian line there and uh, down there in Diyala province. And, and it was like going to the moon. You know, it was like a moonshot for them. And, and then they had to operate off of tactical assembly areas in the Kurdish areas. Well, that was almost like going to Mars, right? So uh, that, that was uh, very problematic for the Iraqi security forces. The only way they were able to do that is through the offices of the, uh, the U.S. and the coalition who provided the assurances to all parties that will be there with you to go to the moon. You're not going to the moon or to the Mars on your own. Uh, so the Martians are, you know, won't, won't uh, uh, you know, come out of the, from behind rocks and attack you and break, break, assure the Martians or the Kurds, hey, uh, this uh, uh, foreign body that we're introducing into your system will, uh, you know, won't spread and, and you know, and create more problems. Uh, so, so that was a critical role that we were able to play. And by the way, we were able to assure the Iranians indirectly, obviously, not directly, but indirectly, that uh, there were a set of rules and a purpose for what we were doing and, uh, and a focus. And uh, we weren't trying to just stir the pot. Yeah, let me just build on those points from John McFarland. So that, um, yeah, I think he's absolutely right that one of the big differences we have between today and 2006, 2007 is the Iranian role, let's stick with Iraq for a moment, and then we can use it as an example to talk about, but is the Iranian influence in Iraq, where in 2006, 2007, we could build the Iraqi military that we wanted because we had all the influence and the Iranians had none. And you know, it's worth exactly to your point, Danny. The army that we were building in 6, 7, 8, 9 was a completely different army. It, wa it wasn't a fully integrated army, but it was much better integrated. Um, you know, General McFarland's point about the 7th Infantry Division, which was formed out in Anbar, was mostly Sunnis. But you know, I can remember being in Basra right after what was called Operation Charge of the Knights, where Maliki sent parts of the Iraqi army with a lot of American support into Basra to break Muqtada Assadr's Jaysh al-Mahdi, which was completely Iranian-supported at the time, and what was fascinating was the units that were brought were two of the brigades of the 7th ID, right? So they came down to Basra, largely Sunnis, and there was a lot of concern about how the Shia of Basra were going to react to these mostly Sunni brigades coming down. And what was stunning was the people of Basra loved them. They got the roses and rice that we thought we were going to get in 2003. They actually got them. Right? And the people you know, embraced them because for them, this was an Iraqi army. Right? They didn't see it as Sunni troops coming into their Shia city. They saw it as the Iraqi army coming to liberate them from the Persian occupiers. Right? It was this unbelievable moment. And it speaks exactly to the point that you're making, that the nationalism is still there, that people do feel it. The problem is, and this really gets to the point that Lieutenant General McCarlin was making later on, when you screw up the politics to the point where the state is collapsing or where it is captured by nasty sectarian chauvinists or you allow the Iranians to get control over it, then the nationalism gets obliterated, right? People can't express the nationalism, which is what they mostly want. And I mean, you know, we, we had elections in Iraq in 2017 they did it again. They all voted for the candidates who they saw as most nationalist. The problem was, and again, this goes back to mistakes that we made in 2010, right? We created an Iraqi political system that meant that that vote was meaningless, right? right? And so, you know, to bring it back to your Lebanon example, I mean, it's all illustrative. If you get the high level politics wrong, the military progress vanishes. Right? And you know this, you, you know, you've forgotten more about Lebanon than I'm ever going to know, but we did the same thing in Lebanon. To the extent that there was any meaningful progress there, where there, there was a moment that you could have built on, right? we just squandered it. Right? We said, you know, the politics is too hard, we're not going to do that, let Hezbollah keep their guns, we won't do anything about it, and now we are where we are. And of course the great danger is we're doing it again in Iraq and Syria. 
So here's here's a question that's of a slightly different uh, tenor, but but you brought up Hezbollah, and I wonder, and then I want to talk a little bit about countries that haven't been involved directly in conflict, but um, or or are now, but that have been either armed uh, or or trained by us. Uh, I'm talking about Egypt and Saudi Arabia in this instance, um, because I, I think that we can tease out some more of the challenges that, that we face up to and maybe work towards what we think the, the answers are and how we should change things. But um, Hezbollah has been fighting in Syria for five years now, um, more, more than five years. Um, geez, is it eight? Wow, it is wow. actually since the Arab Spring. Oh, that's depressing. Um, what? How does? How do? How does that? The existence of these paramilitary forces that have a lot of fighting experience, and we can talk about the PMUs, the Hashd al-Shabi right. in, in Iraq, as the same. Um, unfortunately, mostly working for Iran, as you as you said, um, uh, Lieutenant General McFarland. But um, how does this complicate some of the challenges that we see in the region? Well, I'll just speak from my own experience uh, in in Iraq and Syria. You know, every move that we made uh, against ISIS, we uh, were also considering uh, how to mitigate the uh, expansion uh, of uh, uh, some of the uh, Iranian-backed um, uh, militias, uh, the Hashdashabi, particularly uh, Assad al-Haq and, and uh, Khatib Hezbollah in Iraq, and of course, uh, you know, uh, Lebanese Hezbollah in Syria. Um, you know, that was a consideration. Of course, the IRGC, my counterpart, Qasem Soleimani's guys were uh, sprinkled among them everywhere, too. And, um, and, and of course, the leaders were, uh, you know, Kais Kazali and um, Abu Mahdi Mohandas. I mean, they had been guests of ours at Camp Buka for a while. Uh, we fixed their dental work. That's the big and, prison. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we, we kind of restored their uh, their health so that they could go out and um, kill us. Yeah, so I mean one of the one of the things they kept asking Qasem Soleimani is uh, hey, is it okay for us to attack the Americans? And he would say no, comma not yet, uh, because we were still uh, providing a useful service for Iran's uh, greater goal, which is to create this sort of a land bridge from Lebanon to Iran through Iraq and Syria. Um, and we had to get ISIS out of the way for that to occur. So, um, so th there was a, sort of a, uh, a, a three-sided dance, and of course you could expand that. You know, it depends on you know, how complicated you want to make the discussion, whether you're talking about the Russians, the Turks, the Kurds. There were a lot of <laughs> People in the mix, and uh, what our own uh, national security folks like to call uh, a, a marbled uh, type of a situation. Um, <laughs> soldiers would have used that, a different. Is that the term. new word for fluid? Uh, no, uh, that's uh, mixed up, I guess. You know, uh, and and it was uh, it was that. So anyway, um, the 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 fact that the Iranians were kind of everywhere. Uh, was definitely a factor in, in, in their proxies as well. So. Yeah, this is an incredibly hard uh, issue, Danny, and, and I don't want to gloss over it. I mean, I'll start by saying just I want to piggyback, pick up some points that General McFarland made earlier about you know, this issue of trust, right? One of the things that some of these non-state actors, Hezbollah, the Iraqi Hashdashavi, that they have going for them is they have greater cohesiveness because they have a combination of ideology, right, which helps bind them together. And let's also not forget, um, my friend Mike Eisenstadt at the Washington Institute has done some wonderful work talking about how Hezbollah, Daesh, uh, a number of these groups, Daesh Shabi too, recruit from family networks, right? So this is, another, this is actually an aspect of Arab culture that's beneficial to military effectiveness, because you get much better unit cohesion by recruiting entire families, entire clans into a unit, and they bring their solidarity, that degree of trust, that willingness to fight and die for each other, right? So these are important advantages, and if Hezbollah is one of the cases I talk about in the book, there are some others, but we should note that they've got these built-in advantages, which, you know, we've got to help build them in the Arab armies, they start out with them. 
that's part of the problem. But the bigger problem, honestly, again, is at the top level politics. And you know, the truth is, we're always looking for some workaround, right? Some way around. If we can just do this or that at the ground level, the bad guys won't understand what we're doing. And five years later, they'll wake up and realize that they've been completely integrated into the security forces and they're no longer co. They, they get that. These are not stupid people. Hadi al Amri and Mohandas and Kais Ghazali, they know exactly what we're trying to do. Right? And the bottom line is that you know, that is one of these absolutely critical issues, which you know, the Iranians figured this out. And they've got, you know, we sometimes talk about a Hezbollah model. I think in Iraq, it's actually a Revolutionary Guard model. Right? But the bottom line is, until you are willing to take on those top line political challenges, you know, there's nothing in the world that the Sean McFarlands or the Paula Cameras, they, you know, they got, there's nothing in the world that they're going to be able to do to fix things. Okay, I want to open uh, uh, things up to questions, but I also don't want to let either of you off the hook. I've got two questions because we are blaming a lot on the Iranians, on sectarian differences, on these conflict zones. Okay, but I got to tell you, you got none of that in Saudi Arabia. You got none of that in Egypt. These are remarkably uniform ethnically, uh, um, you know, in every other way, religiously. And yet, performance-wise, gah. <laughs> uh, okay, what, you talked about this in your presentation, but I mean, again, you know, what, what, what do we see, and is there, and is this also a politics problem? Sure, let me, when I start. Yeah, please. You know, I've been working on the Egyptians and, and Saudis for a long time, too. And again, I talk about both of them in the book, um, the Egyptians in particular, because you, know, you look at them from 67 to 73, and there's some improvement, but it's kind of interesting and weird. And then, of course, after 73, it's just kind of a long descent. Um, and again, with the Egyptians and the Saudis both, it's this combination. It's the politics, it's the economics and underdevelopment, and it is the cultural issues. Right. And in particular, the, the Egyptians are really interesting and important because, first of all, they realize after the Six-Day War that they've got these problems. And what's fascinating about them is you know, Nasser and Sadat completely depoliticize their ranks. Right? And they have really good generals running the army in 1973. And one of the most important things that they do is they figure out, OK, we have this set of problems, and they're, and they're cultural, which means we're not going to fix them. Not anytime soon. It's going to take a generation or more to fix them. So we have to come up with workarounds, right? And they do some fascinating things. Just really quickly, because it's a great one. So one of the things that they figure out is, look, because of, of the system and because of these concepts of honor and shame, and I know there are many people around this room who are very familiar with the Middle East and they've experienced this, you have severe problems of information management in all of the Arab armies. Right? And again, the, the Egyptian general staff after 67 understands it. They know that their military was lying left, right, and center all across the force in 67. They got to do something about it, but they understand this is a cultural trait. They're not going to fix it in time to take on the Israelis. So they come up with something unbelievably clever. Right? They realize that there's an Israeli cultural trait, which is the Israelis won't shut up. Right? They are endlessly talking to each other, and they are contemptuous of the Arabs, so they don't actually encrypt any of their communications. And what these Egyptian generals figure out is, OK, we can't trust our officers to tell us what's going on. We can trust the Israelis to tell us what's going on. Because the Israelis are incredibly honest, ruthlessly so. Right? They're obnoxious about it. They won't shut up. They won't encrypt. And so the Egyptians build a massive, signals intelligence collection facility on this mountain called Jebel Ataka, which runs along the west side of the canal. They just festoon it with antennas. They train all of these Hebrew language speakers, and they put them there, co-located. And during the early days of the October War, they're just picking up all the Israeli comms, translating them in real time, and then feeding that back to the high command so they know what's going on. Right? It's one of the reasons why early on the Egyptians do well. But on, July, sorry, on October 14th, when the Egyptians make their main secondary offensive, the Israelis start the day by plastering Jebel Ataka. And they take down all of the communications. And once that happens, all of a sudden, the Egyptians are in the dark again. So come back to the point, 
these problems exist, right, but they're not easily fixed. And ultimately, wind, what the Arab states wind up doing is they try these workarounds, which can be modestly effective, but at the end of the day, they're never an actual solution for the set of problems, right? And you know, so as we go into this and as we start talking about, okay, what, you know, what have we been doing with the Egyptians? What have we been doing with the Saudis? Part of it is you know, a, a, an unwillingness to recognize on our part. And again, I, I think you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have Lieutenant General McFarland here is that you know, his command actually was the one that started to figure out, okay, how do we have to actually do this right? Because for too long and still for, in too many places in the Middle East, we simply go in and assume that these guys are just like us, right? And we try to train them the way that we would train a bunch of American kids. Not recognizing they are not American kids. They come at this completely differently. They've got some strengths, but they've got a bigger set of issues that our training isn't designed to address. Because as I said, our system is designed for our society. Right? And we've got to be thinking about it. And by the way, you know, just to finish it, you were kind of getting it. You know, one of the interesting things for me about doing this book was seeing the British and the French and the Russians make the same mistakes and experience the exact same frustrations that we did as they tried to train Arab armies. Right? And again, people tend to blame the Russians. You're saying you know, we shouldn't let ourselves off the hook, and I agree with you. But what is fascinating is the Russians had all the same frustrations. It's not their fault either. But it is their fault in the sense that they, too, refused to adapt their training. And as a result, their training was just as problematic and had just as little impact on their Arab clients as ours did for ours. Want to add anything to that? Uh, I'll just close out. I obviously defer to Ken on Egypt, and, uh, and I have some experience with the Saudis, and I agree with that. Um, I, I would just say that uh, you know war is hard, and uh, every army has a little bit of sand in it, okay? Uh, it, it's just a matter of degree. We have some sand in our own. Uh, we have some top-down isms as well. Uh, they hindered our ability, I think, in 2004 and five, mm -hmm. and, and until and through 2006 to react to the reality that we saw in Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom. Uh, what sustained us was we got it right at the lower level, uh, even though we were struggling at the top level. And our young soldiers, non-commissioned officers, uh, junior officers, uh, held our army together and our Marines together, um, even while uh, uh, we leaders were still wrestling with the, you know, coming to terms with the right answer uh, to that fight. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're fortunate to have a society that creates that kind of a, a junior uh, uh, echelon uh, that can sustain us when the top echelon is not up to the task. Uh, we eventually got it right. It took us longer than it should have, though. So, you know, like I said, we all have a little bit of sand in our army. Very graciously said. Why don't we open up to questions? Um, and if I can just ask you to follow our rules, which is, A, I'll call on you, wait for a mic. Um, Give us your name, even if, even if you know we know you. Um, and, uh, and keep your brilliant statement in the form of a question. Mike. Mike's coming here. Uh, so, uh, Michael Gordon, Wall Street Journal. Uh, so for General McFarlane. Um, so obviously, um, Maliki has been blamed and should be blamed for a lot of the problems that were manifest in the Iraqi army. But uh, taking aside Maliki, um, what I'd like to ask you is um, if Maliki had done everything right, um, I think the Iraqi army still would have had a lot of logistical problems, leadership issues, didn't have an air force when we left, poor intelligence, couldn't do combined arms. And we found it necessary to bulk up a little bit in Afghanistan. So the United States has made enormous efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan, spent tons of money over a period of years, huge exertions. And in both instances, it's failed to leave behind a force that can stand on its own. Um, looking at the American performance in training indigenous forces, what do you think uh, the United States could do differently in training these foreign armies, 
Or is it simply the case that these forces can't stand on their own, that the U.S. needs to accept that if we intervene, we need to stay there indefinitely to enable and support these armies, and that they can never really be an exit strategy for the United States? Uh, taking your the second part of the question first, uh, whether or not there's an exit strategy, uh, I would say that's, uh, at this point, unclear. I, I would say that for the foreseeable future, we need to stay engaged. That's no guarantee of victory, but not to be engaged is an amount to a guarantee of failure. So I, I do think that we do, as long as we're providing aid to uh, a country, we need to have a proportional presence. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to recognize uh, much of an ROI. Um, that said, uh, no, Maliki is not the only factor uh, in the uh, collapse of the Iraqi security forces uh, by a long stretch. There are some inherent challenges there as well, as Ken points out in his book. So, uh, so I, I, I won't attribute it all to Nouri al-Maliki, but I would say he, he certainly accentuated uh, and accelerated their collapse, their, accentuated their problems and accelerated their collapse through his uh, kind of ham-handed um, leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, can, uh, can an Arab army ever stand on its own two feet um, and, and defeat? Look, you know, you don't have to be, I used to say this, you know, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the other guy that the bear is chasing, right? You know, so we don't have to train Arab armies to be as good as we are. We just have to train them to be relatively better than the threat that they faced. With Iraq, we did not train them to be better than the threat that they were going to face from ISI. Um, we thought they were going to be facing some sort of a homegrown insurgency, low level that, you know, mainly a police force could handle. And who did they end up facing? A hybrid, almost conventional army. They were completely untrained, ill-equipped, and uh, unprepared to fight an ar a force like that. They were flat-footed uh, from the get-go. Whose fault is that? Well, they didn't have the intelligence. Uh, could they have had better intelligence if we'd stayed engaged, if we'd been able to hammer out a sofa with Maliki's government? Maybe, but we missed it too. We were calling them the JV team while they were, uh, you know, running all over the place. So, uh, you know, again, no guarantee of success, but um, having us there certainly improves the odds. Can I jump in on this? Because, sure. again, Joe, I, I think that in some ways, you know, your answer is exactly right. I just want to pull out one piece of it. And it's, I do think that what we did in OIR is the template for moving forward, right? Because the way I describe it is there are two critical things that we did with the ISF. One, we built the CTS, mm -hmm. right, which was the small force with quite a bit of capability. Which, by the way, that process was underway even during our absence. Right. I mean, that, right. That yeah, it started even before. We didn't start that in 2014, right. right. As, but, the super, as the special forces say, when you need a friend, it's too late to make one, right? <laughs> Right, right, great one. Right. They, so, you know, a small force with some real capability that allows you to do certain things with it. But then a larger force that we did retrain and recognized, you know, it was not going to be able to do what a line U.S. unit could do, but nevertheless could do some other things, right? Could certainly hold territory, prevent ISIS from striking in other places, certainly, you know, go in after the CTS to mop up, to right. again secure the population, right. Right. right? And so that does give you a certain amount of capability to on, take on certain threats. And that was a much more capable force than right. what had been there in 2014, or as you point out, what we built in even 2007. And again, would be better than what we've got in Egypt today, right? So that's one thing. But then, yeah, the ultimate point is the one that you made at the end, which is, you know, will they need American support? Depends on who they're fighting, right? If the, you know, on certain lower level threats, that kind of a force should be able to handle it. The more daunting the threat they face, the more help they'll need. Yeah, I mean, they didn't, ha they didn't need us to, the Iraqis didn't need us to overrun Kuwait in 1990. 
Well, I think that <laughs> they got that bear part of the thing right there in Kuwait. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell. I write the Mitchell Report uh, and read all of Ken's books. Um, on you no know, less than four or five occasions, I, Ken has begun a sentence by saying, when you get the high-level politics wrong, dot, 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 uh, which has uh, me thinking a lot about countries that get their high-level politics wrong <laughs> and that um, it's arguable that we are living in one. Um, added to that, um, we are seeing levels of partisanship and polarization at the citizen level between families uh, that uh, uh, I think none of us in this room have experienced. I'm not. I'm not trying to f feign a. a uh, a question on this. What I'm saying is, is it your, your closing comment gave me some level of of comfort that um, you know the, the the troops will will get us through. But I really do wonder whether or not the combination of getting our politics at the top wrong, the polarization uh, arguably at the at the uh, at the foot soldier level, uh, is something that the that the armed forces uh, should be concerned about and whether there is something that can be done in training or should be done in training th uh, that can sort of keep us on track. So, yeah, absolutely, and we do that. Uh, it, it, you know, my last job in the Army, I was the deputy commander for the training and doctrine command, so all the recruiting and all the initial entry training was under training and doctrine command, and, and it is something that we do focus on. Uh, we call it soldierization. Uh, we uh, assimilate people into the Army and teach them what it's like to be part of a cohesive whole. And many people come from, well, I mean, soldiers come from all walks of life, and uh, we bring them all together. And it's remarkable that after basic training or, uh, or their uh, initial training, um, how acculturated they become. I mean, we used to talk about the melting pot in schools in America. I don't know if we still do anymore. My guess is we don't. Um, and, uh, I mean, I just heard uh, a statistic uh, recently that uh, about 80% of American kids uh, consider themselves as just plain old Americans before they enter high school and about two-thirds of them, about halfway through college, become hyphenated Americans. Uh, we remove those hyphens in the Army, uh, in the military. Uh, you know, you're a soldier. Next question. You know, you got, we all wear the same patch on our right shoulder, uh, the American flag, and that's what it's all about. Um, and uh, and, and that's, that's a process that most armies do not uh, really go through probably don't have to go through it in some armies where everybody is monolinguistic, monoethnic, or whatever, you know, Finland or someplace like that. But in the United States, we do. They should go through it in Arab armies, but they don't. Um, and, and that's a significant difference. Is it getting harder in the U.S. military to uh, assimilate everybody and get everybody on the same plane for the same team? Yeah, it is. Identity politics is a cancer. Uh, and, uh, and an army is a reflection of its society. And, if, and we have seen what balkanization looks like. I've been in the Balkans uh, uh, multiple times and, uh, and in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and it's a dangerous path that uh, we're moving along. And eventually, it's going to become too hard for us to fix uh, in the military. And the most important thing to remember, of course, is that when you're in the army, there really only is one enemy, and that's the Navy. That's right, beat Navy, obviously. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> Barbara Leaf, the Washington Institute. Um, you know, I'm curious, um, in your reflections about um, the fact that uh, not just the U.S., but the Russians, the British, the French have also 
um, sort of uh, knock their heads uh, metaphorically against a brick wall in terms of trying to um, imprint upon uh, these armies uh, their own um, mindset of what is you know culturally ours in terms of training and, and doctrine and so forth. But I wonder if you could, notwithstanding um, what you outlined in terms of uh, you know the 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 push towards an IRGC-like model standing alongside, parallel to, independent from uh, the Iraqi security forces, and I agree that's the more likely scenario or objective than, say, Hezbollah. Where do you see the Iranians banging into the same stony reality um, and finding that their model does, doesn't take, doesn't imprint? Uh, notwithstanding this smaller unit, Khatab, Hezbollah, et cetera, cohesiveness. We do know that they complain sometimes when they try to do security force assistance about their, the indigenous forces that they're working with. Uh, so obviously it's, you know, there are tiers of, uh, uh, you know, and, and, you know, if you're one step up on the, uh, you know, one higher rung on the ladder, you're going to complain about the folks one rung lower. We may be talking about some folks that are several rungs below us, but everybody has, the Russians had frustrations in Syria too. So, um, and we had our own. So, I mean, it, yeah, if there are, you know, whenever you're trying to get, do something by, with, and through, punch with other people's fists, as uh, somebody once called it, uh, that, that is a, uh, that's going to lead you to some frustration, right? I used to say you cannot inflict support on people. You can't necessarily get them to do things that they don't want to do every time. There's a quid pro quo. Uh, if, you, if I allow you to do this and help you do that, will you help me do this? Yes, okay. So you work through all of that. Um, if you're rigid, uh, you're going to be more frustrated. Uh, you have to be a lot more flexible. And, and that was one of, kind of the ways we got the awakening started in, 2006 was, uh, you know, I, the other uh, metaphor I used a lot was, uh, you know, everything you do when you work with local indigenous forces is kind of a judo throw, right? You're trying to use their mass and momentum in the direction they wanted to go against them and trying to get them to go and deflect them into a more productive direction. So, all right, let me kind of let you go this way and then maybe move you over that way a little bit and, and get you to attack that city if I promise, you know, not to prevent you from doing something that you want to do, maybe turn a blind eye someplace else. I mean, that's what it takes. If you, if you try to say, no, everything's got to be my way or the highway, it, it just is going to fail. Let me see if I can add a couple of points onto the, the, the core points that General Farley made, which is, first point I make, Barbara, is that the Iranians learned as much from Hezbollah as Hezbollah learned from them. In fact, I would actually argue more, especially when it came to, co to uh, co conventional combat. And worth remembering, you know, the, the, Iran the Iranians send 2,000 of their IRGC guys to Lebanon in 1983 to help Hezbollah beat the Israelis. Um, and of course, Hezbollah is not only trying to mount terrorist operations against Israel, they're also trying to wage a civil war, right? They're becoming a, a Shia militia. They send 1,500 of those guys home. Why? Because they're trying to teach them human wave tactics, right? which is what the Iranians are doing to the Iraqis at the same time. And Hezbollah realizes this is a terrible way to fight a war. right? So they send them home, and they actually figure out on their own how more or less to fight. And I would actually argue they are better than the Iranians at conventional warfare. Um, the Iranians learn far more from them. It's one of the reasons why come 2012, right, when Qusair is in danger of falling, the Iranians call in Hezbollah, right? And those Hezbollah formations are very effective. They are the most effective ground forces of their coalition, right? As General McFarland pointed out earlier, though, I completely agree with him, their coalition has not been as effective as our coalition. And you look what we did with 2,000 guys and the, the Kurds uh, and the SDF, I think it's been far more effective than what the Iranians have done with 5,000, 10,000 of their guys, Hezbollah, these Shia militias. Now, again, as General McFarland pointed out, you don't have to be fabulous, right? You don't have to be able to defeat the Wehrmacht or the IDF. You just have to be better than the guys you're fighting, right? And they are unquestionably better than the guys that they are fighting. 
But you know, when I look at how they've handled their operations and we've handled ours, I actually think that we, are, we have been more effective than they have been. So again, they've got a model. It works, and last point I'll make, important one, a lot of the success that the Iranians are getting, it's worth noting, the Iranians are teaching people how to do unconventional warfare, right? Which is easier, right? In most cases, you're doing unconventional warfare because these guys can't do conventional warfare. If they could, they would. It's much faster, more efficient, leads to a more decisive outcome. The Iranians have to do the unconventional piece because their guys or you know, their, their allies aren't up to the task of waging a conventional war. Uh, wow, we've been talking too much. Um, we have a question here and then a question here, and I think we're going to have to. Why don't we start with this young man here over at that table, and then uh, and then over to you, and then you'll be our our last one, and you guys can grab these two after the session. Thank you, uh, Timur Aladiri, Netherlands Embassy. I was just wondering. Uh, we've heard uh, uh, some new plans uh, from the administration uh, for um, about the Middle East uh, strategic alliance, which is. Uh, also has a security dimension, uh, trying to uh, have uh, armies uh, work together. So I was just wondering uh, what advice you would have uh, for, the, for the White House on this and uh, how you assess the viability of that initiative. I'll just say one quick thing about that. Uh, standing coalitions uh, tend to fight better than ad hoc coalitions. It took, takes a heck of a long time to integrate uh, 29 50, 60 countries into anything resembling a useful military force uh, if you don't start with some sort of a common level of interoperability, understanding uh, policies and procedures in place. In NATO, we have the standing NATO agreements, STANAGs, uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, you know, it take, you'd be surprised. The simple things are very difficult when you're trying to assemble a coalition to fight a threat. Um, why was NATO created? Uh, you know, uh, Lord Aston said famously to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down, right? Uh, why would you want to create something like that in the Middle East? Well, to keep the Iranians and now the Russians out, maybe, of some of the Arab countries, to keep uh, the uh, uh, as radical Islamists. Uh, terrorist organizations down, and to keep the Americans and the Western allies in, right? So is that a, a, a cause or a, a reason to create something like that? Sure. Are there problems with that? Absolutely. Um, you know, but uh, it might be worth a try. As General Petraeus said, you know, hard isn't hopeless. Over here. Thank you. No, no, no. Other side. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Kim Dozier, Daily Beast. So, uh, General McFarland, um, if you explained that one of the ways that the CTS won was by the leaders going into the lead and that that works with this hierarchy structure within Arab militaries that Kenna described, does that mean you're destined to train people who you're going to lose? And then one for Ken, um, you said that Arab militaries hadn't learned from that German army dictum that you've got to set commander's intent and let the guys on the ground or the women on the ground carry it out. What Arab army is closest? And then a last thing on your comment about the US-led coalition seemed to do better than the Iranian-led coalition. Didn't air power, in a sense, serve the role as the CTS that provided everyone um, the courage they needed to move forward? So, simple answer to your first question, yes, it is. That's what war is. I mean, uh, as Sherman said, war means fighting and fighting means killing. And you can't refine it any more than that. So, uh, we train our own soldiers uh, in the same way. We expect them to carry on with the mission uh, even in the face of losses. Uh, and you know from your personal experience uh, that that's what we do, right? Uh, and, and uh, that's what we have to train. Any, to be effective, that's what you have to be able to do. You have to be able to fight even when you lose uh, leaders. Somebody else has to step up and take that place and carry on. With the mission. So very quickly, Kim, I'm going to start with your second question first. So the issue of air power. You're right, the air power is very effective, but let's remember the Iranian coalition had Russian air power 
which wasn't as effective as ours. Um, and again, you still have to learn how to work with the air power, right? I mean, I can remember early days, one of the things that General McFarland did was to figure out, okay, how do you use air power in these circumstances where, frankly, we're mostly relying on Iraqi ground forces and Syrian ground forces, not American ground forces, right? That's a very yeah. different or, kind of thing. Or, or third-party type of organizations like the Hasta Shabi, uh, where you, know, I, you, you wouldn't want to provide air support to Khatib Hezbollah, but you want to kill ISIS fighters. And we had to work through a process to do that. So again, I would say it's, it's more even on the two sides, because the Russian air power was also there in quite a bit of force. I just think we found, it, we found ways to use it more effectively in support of our indigenous ground forces than they did theirs. Um, on the, the bottom-up tactics, South Clay's tactique, the, the kind of uh, you know, German model, the issue is less that the Arabs don't recognize it. They do. Right? One of the interesting things is that at various points, various Arab armies have tried to teach it. Right? They've either had us teach it, or the Brits teach it, or the Russians teach it, because the Russians understand it too, or they tried to teach it themselves. Right? And the problem wasn't that they didn't understand the need for it. The problem was it never took purchase. Right? Because again, what you consistently find is you can teach it all you want. And you know, our guys have this frustration all the time, and I've seen it. You know, on training ranges in, you know, from Iraq to Egypt, where our guys go in and they try to teach it, and their Arab charges, it, it's just not there for them. They can't, the idea of taking the initiative, of making the decision themselves without getting the expressed approval of higher command as to what they do, it, it, it's just not there for them. Now, really critical point that I was trying to get. There are always people who can, right? Culture is not uniform. It's just tendencies, right? You can always find guys who can. That's why when you build a force like the CTS, often what you're doing is picking out the guys and gals who actually can do that, right? And they all, they're always there in every society. Last point, their society's changing, right? That's where I ended my prepared remarks. And what we've got to think about is we don't know how their society is changing. But look, the Arab Spring of 2011 was unthinkable. 30 years earlier. And it speaks to economic, political, and cultural shifts that are already going on in the Arab world. They may be in a different place in a few years. We've already used up our time and more. Let me thank both of you, but especially you, Lieutenant General McFarland, for being willing to share your, your time with us, and Ken for writing a really timely and, and an important book. Everybody should buy it. And uh, thank you.